Thank you for the opportunity to present today. I'm Katerina Wells, and I'm a staff colorectal surgeon at Baylor University Medical Center in Dallas. Intra-abdominal abscesses present a significant source of morbidity and mortality, approaching upwards of 68% if accompanied by septic shock. As with all infectious processes when accompanied by sepsis, the first priority in management is to treat the sepsis, with clear guidelines for resuscitation as outlined by the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. In addition to resuscitation measures, early antibiotic therapy and source control remain mainstays of treatment, and we'll focus on these two measures throughout the talk. Source control in the case of intra-abdominal abscess is guided first by classifying the infection as uncomplicated and involving one organ but not the peritoneum or complicated with peritonitis. In the case of uncomplicated infection, antibiotics alone may be an effective strategy for treatment. In the case of complicated infection resulting from loss of integrity of the GI tract or other infected viscera, drainage and or debridement may be required to achieve source control. Options for source control are listed below. For surgical source control, minimally invasive approaches, as in the case of laparoscopic lavage, can be used at the discretion of the surgeon, but the decision to do so must be weighed against the physiologic impact of the pneumoperitoneum on the septic patient. There are no clear guidelines for the choice of antibiotic agents, but empirical antibiotics should be chosen to cover the most common pathogens present in intra-abdominal organs, including Enterobacter, Streptococcus, and anaerobic bacteria, most common of which is Bacteroides. For healthcare-associated infections, antibiotic regimens with broader spectra of, of activity are recommended as they have higher risk of housing ESBL-producing bacteria. Candida um, therapy should also be included for hospital-acquired intra-abdominal infections, upper GI anastomotic leaks, and in those patients with immunosuppression, steroid dependence, or the critically ill person. Let's now discuss some specific pathologies and some of the unique considerations for treatment of abscess. Acute, acute left colonic complicated diverticulitis is one of the most common colorectal pathologies, and research on the subject has informed the management of most other colorectal pathologies resulting in intra-abdominal abscess. In the case of complicated disease, 15 to 20% of patients will present with an intra-abdominal abscess. Antibiotics are the first line of treatment, and adjunctive measures of percutaneous drainage can be performed if the abscess is large, usually greater than three to six centimeters, and some guidelines say greater than four centimeters. If the abscess persists after a reasonable length of antibiotic therapy, or in the case of clinical deterioration. Percutaneous drainage can be performed provided there's a safe window to target the abscess and the contents of the collection are homogeneous. If this isn't possible, antibiotics with close monitoring and an interval imaging is acceptable. This strategy is 95% successful, even in the case of a large collection measuring greater than four centimeters and moderate volume distant free air. Among those who has successful non-operative management, the risk of recurrent attacks is about 28%. However, 28% also remain asymptomatic at long-term follow-up, suggesting that there's a small subset of people who ultimately don't require surgery or any other intervention. When initial treatment fails, surgical management is needed. For most patients, resection is the most appropriate surgical approach. I won't go into great detail, only to say that the experience from the DIVERTI trial found comparable mortality and morbidity between Hartman's resection and primary anastomosis with diverting ostomy with a higher rate of ostomy reversal after primary anastomosis. Non-resectional strategies like laparoscopic lavage have been considered over the past decade or so with the aim of organ preservation. This approach is reserved for patients with Hinchy class three diverticulitis where the purulent peritonitis is aggressively suctioned and the peritoneum is treated with lavage. This approach has steadily fallen out of favor as its indications are quite narrow as met and meta-analysis of three large multi-center trials recognize a risk of higher reoperation and recurrence of abscess requiring percutaneous drainage with this approach. Penetrating Crohn's disease is another commonly encountered cause of spontaneous abscess. The most common site of spontaneous abscess is in the ileocecal area due to ileitis. Postoperative abscesses also can happen and are usually due to leak or contaminated peritoneal fluid in the setting of immunosuppression. Traditionally, management strategies involved early surgical intervention with open drainage, extended resection, and often ostomy given the friability of acutely infected tissue. Current management is far different and conservative with antibiotics with or without percutaneous drainage, an assessment of underlying disease activity with both enterography and endoscopy. Success of initial treatment by percutaneous drainage allows for avoidance of early surgery in up to 14 to 85% of patients. 
Enterography, either by CTE or MRE, is more sensitive than small bowel follow-through or plain MRI for evaluation of extra enteric complications like fistula. Enterography can also aid in distinguishing fibrosynodic disease from active disease that would be more responsive to medical therapy. This slide offers an algorithm for the management of Crohn's-related abscess. In this treatment algorithm, the authors of this review recommend serial imaging every four to six weeks or obsessogram every one to two weeks and initiation of immunosuppressive therapy once the abscess is resolved. Immunosuppressive therapy can be started or fine-tuned for a trial of spontaneous healing or at least allow for optimization of the patient and reduce the extent of resection after acute inflammation has resolved. Management of post-surgical abscess secondary to anastomotic leak begins with prevention. Meticulous surgical technique and mitigation of risk factors are paramount. However, when leaks do occur, early identification with the use of procalcitonin and CRP offer a post-op day five negative predictive value of 95 to 100% and post-op day four negative predictive value of 78.8% respectively. A grading system for colorectal anastomotic leaks was developed by the International Study Group of Rectal Cancer, where grade A anastomotic leaks are identified radiographically in the absence of clinical findings and can be managed expectantly. Grade B leaks require therapeutic intervention, but not necessarily reoperation. Antibiotics and percutaneous drainage are the most commonly used interventions, but emerging experience with stenting and endovac therapies are also gaining popularity. Grade C and astomotic leaks require relaparotomy due to the presence of sepsis, and in this case, diversion is recommended over resection unless a greater than 50 to 100% dehiscence, ischemia, or necrosis are found. Rectal trauma is another area where management of pelvic abscess has changed a great deal over the past several decades. Historically, treatment of traumatic rectal perforations followed a dogma of diversion, rectal washout, presacral drainage, and direct repair. Most current literature supports diversion alone with a fairly low rate of pelvic sepsis and mortality. Presacral drainage does not offer a reduction in pelvic sepsis rates and, prevents, and presents significant morbidity to the patient. Rectal washout to reduce contamination also does not reduce pelvic sepsis rates and may actually be harmful with the theoretical risk of introducing infection into previously uninfected areas through hydrodissection of traumatized tissue. Direct rectal repair, either transanally or transabdominally, can be technically difficult and exposure of the low rectum can introduce injury to adjacent structures. The AAST offers a grading scale for rectal trauma that when applied to the civilian population also supports conservative management of grade one injuries. More aggressive measures for these slight injuries result in increased morbidity owing to diversion or direct repair. This conservative approach is associated with a 0% mortality and 15% morbidity. However, the majority of civilian rectal trauma is grade two, three, or four, secondary to penetrating trauma, with those injuries requiring at least relaparotomy and diversion. The authors of this study report a mortality rate of 4% and morbidity of 3%. In summary, abscesses are a common theme across many colorectal emergencies. Each underlying pathology has nuance that affects successful management of abscess. My takeaways for you are prioritize early resuscitation and antibiotic administration. Be conservative if the patient is stable. Laparoscopic lavage offers inadequate source control evidenced by its high rate of reoperation and percutaneous drainage. Assess for active penetrating Crohn's disease and treat it prior to resection. And treat rectal trauma with diversion alone when possible. Thank you very much for your time and I'm happy to take any questions at the panel discussion.